This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. To pre-order Foundations, use my link in the description. Hi everyone, I'm Neat Sahone, and in this video I'm going to give you my picks for the 10 biggest bombs in Foundations Limited. In Magic, a bomb is a good thing. It refers to a card that is so powerful that it drastically alters a game in your favor, with many bombs even being capable of pulling you back ahead from behind. In other words, these are the cards that you most want to open in your sealed pool or see in a pack one, pick one situation. If you're interested in my thoughts on more than just the strongest cards in the set, then you should check out my set review where I gave my thoughts on every single card in the set. Before we get into the list though, let me tell you about this video's special sponsor, u who has just released some great licensed magic products, and I have a couple of prototypes of these awesome items to show you. First, there's a collection of three vinyl figures of some of the game's most iconic planeswalkers, Liliana, Jace, and as you can see here, Chandra. The detail on these figures is amazing, with Chandra's armor and goggles looking especially amazing. There are also three plushies of some of the cutest characters from Bloomborough, Helga, Phineas, and Mabel. And you know that I had to request Mabel, the mouse, when you two's contacted me about this sponsorship. She's even holding her magical sword, Cragflame. If you're interested in picking up some of these awesome magic figures in plushes, use my link in the description and use my code NEEDSAHONE to get 10% off your purchase. And if you want them, make sure you get on it soon because they are limited edition and once they're sold out, they'll be gone forever. All right, here are my picks for the 10 biggest bombs in Foundations. At number 10, I've got Celestial Armor. For two generic and a white, it's an artifact equipment with flash, and when it enters, you attach it to target creature you control. That creature gains hexproof and indestructible until end of turn, and the equipped creature gets plus two plus zero and has flying, and it equips for three generic and a white. While it isn't quite Ember Cleave, I do think this card is going to feel really similar a lot of the time. And by the way, Ember Cleave is in this set and it is a bomb. I'm just not including special guests in this video because they're even rarer than the rest of the cards we're going to see. It compares favorably with Ember Cleave because it comes into play and it lets your creature win combat in a big way and then leaves behind a buff that is going to make almost any creature into a threat. It's even better in Ember Cleave in one way, and that is that it's also capable of blanking a removal spell. So there are a couple of different situations where you immediately get a card worth of value out of your opponent, either running over their creature that was blocking yours or blanking their removal spell, and then this sticks around and gives plus two plus zero and flying to stuff. Equipping it for four isn't amazing, of course, but you have to look at that as upside on top of what this does when it comes into play, which is often going to be where it's the most impactful. You're just going to win most games where you resolve Celestial Armor. Next up, we got Sphinx of Forgotten Lore, which for two generic and two blue is a 3-3 with flash and flying, and when it attacks, target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard gains flashback until end of turn. The flashback cost is equal to that card's mana cost. So a 4-mana 3-3 with flash and flying is a pretty solid card to begin with. You can flash it into play and ambush block like a 2-2. If you do that, you're already setting yourself up for a 2-for-1. But what really makes this incredibly strong is the fact that then you get to untap with it in play, probably attack your opponent without too much difficulty because it's a 3-3 flyer, and then cast an instant or sorcery from your graveyard too. That means this has like 3-for-1 potential. The reason it's kind of low on this list, and it's true as well for... Celestial Armor is that both of them to really thrive do need a little bit of setup. They need the situation to be right. In the case of the Sphinx, you've got to have instants and sorceries in your graveyard, of course. But I do think that's more than doable in blue decks. And most of the time, you'll be able to at least get an easy two for one out of this. And by the way, it keeps doing that every time it attacks, provided you have spells in your graveyard for it to keep casting. At number eight, I have Curator of Destinies. It's a six mana, five, five that can't be countered with flying. And then it has an Inter's Trigger that is reminiscent of fact or fiction. You look at the top five cards of your library and separate them into a face down pile and a face up pile. An opponent chooses one of those piles, put that pile into your hand and the other into your graveyard. So you get a pretty efficient flyer that can often end the game in two or three swings by the time it comes down. That alone isn't enough to make a card into a bomb, especially when it's a little overcosted. like a 6-mana 5-5 five, five flyer isn't the best deal in the world. But when it's stapled to a card that's effectively also going to draw you at least two cards while loading your graveyard, which might give you threshold, we're talking about a really powerful card because even if your opponent manages to kill the Curator, you still have the cards that it gave you. 
At number seven, it's Twin Flame Tyrant. For three generic and two red, it is a 3-5 with flying, and if a source you control would deal damage to an opponent or a permanent opponent controls, it deals double that damage instead. So on its own, this is a 5-mana 3-5 that effectively attacks as a 6-5 because it will damage creatures that block it. It'll do 6 to them, and it'll do 6 to your opponent when it hits them. That's a pretty good card to begin with, but it's way better than that because it offers that buff to all of your sources of damage. It doesn't even care what color they are. Sometimes we see these and it's like red sources of damage. Nope, Twin Flame Tyrant doesn't care. He's going to double the damage of all your sources of damage, and that means the turn he comes down, he's often going to drastically augment your board. Like, if you have a 2-2 and a 3-3 in play, suddenly they're both really good attackers because there's probably not anything your opponent has that can block them without also dying, and there's a chance they're wide open and they just smash in for a bunch of damage. So generally, you're going to get value out of Twin Flame Tyrant the turn it comes down, and then if they don't kill it, well, the game's probably over on the next turn. At number six, I have Kaito, Cunning Infiltrator. For one generic and two blue, it's a Planeswalker that starts with three loyalty. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you put a loyalty counter on Kaito. He's got a plus one that says up to one target creature you control can't be blocked this turn, draw a card, then discard a card. And he's got a minus two that makes a two one blue ninja creature token. He's also got a minus nine that says you get an emblem with whenever a player casts a spell, you create a two one blue ninja creature token. Kaito is incredibly cheap for the impact he's going to have on a game. If you play Kaito on turn three, you're going to win the game the vast majority of the time. This is because he's going to come down, make your two drop unblockable, ultimately gives him two loyalty because he gets a plus one to his loyalty from using his plus one, and then your creature hits your opponent, which gives him another plus one. So in a lot of ways, his plus one is more like a plus two, and then you get to loot, which is no small thing. You're going to increase your card quality while pressuring your opponent, and there's virtually no way they can kill Kaito, even if you don't have anything else to protect him that turn, because his loyalty is so high. And then you can keep using that plus one and keep using it to raise his loyalty, while also trying to find creatures who can protect him. Later in the game, it's going to be a little harder to generate that kind of value, but his minus two does make a token that can protect him, and even if all Kaito does is come down uses minus two to make a two one, then you manage to keep Kaito alive for a turn, then use the plus one, and then Kaito dies. Well, you're still getting a really good deal. You're making your opponent attack Kaito and you paid three mana to get a two one and loot and get in for some damage. Like that's the fail case. And oftentimes he'll really run away with the game. Notably, he can even raise his loyalty even more. If you play him when you have a board that's at parity or if you're ahead, you can just attack and raise his loyalty even more, and then he's going to be really hard for your opponent to take down. So Kaito's great. On turn three, he's virtually always going to win you the game, and even later in the game, he's going to be a very powerful planeswalker. His plus one makes it so he's always going to be relevant. At number five, I have Chandra, Flame Shaper. For five generic and two red, she's a six loyalty planeswalker. She's got a plus two that gives you three red mana, then you exile your top three cards and choose one, and you can play that card this turn. She got a plus one that says create a token that's a copy of target creature you control, except it has haste and at the beginning of the end step, sacrifice this token. And she has a minus four that does eight damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures and or planeswalkers. Chandra's kind of the opposite of Kaito. You know, if you get Kaito early, he's going to take over the game. Chandra's really expensive. Sometimes you won't get to the mana you need to cast her. But if you play her, you're virtually always going to win the game, and that's what a seven mana card should do. This is largely because her minus four will usually mean she can come down and destroy the bulk of your opponent's board, and then she gets to stick around with two loyalty and start using her other abilities, which will press the advantage you've created using her minus four, either drawing extra cards, making extra mana, or sending in copies of whatever your best creature is. She's just going to win you the game when you can cast her. It's just a question of getting to seven mana, but overall, this does look like a format where getting to seven mana will happen. It doesn't look like the fastest format ever, and I don't think they would have given us nearly as many seven mana cards as they did if it wasn't something that's pretty doable in the format. And number four, we have another card that costs seven mana, that being Sire of Seven Deaths, which is seven mana for a seven seven with First Strike Vigilance, Menace, Trample, Reach, and Lifelink. If we stopped there, this would already be a great card because if you ever get to attack with it, the game's pretty much over. It's almost impossible for your opponent to have a good way to block a creature with all these keywords 
and that generally means they're either going to have to chump block ugly or take seven. Either way, you gain seven life and do a bunch of damage to their board. Vigilance means your opponent can't really attack you either, especially because he's also got reach. So he might have been at the bottom of this list, even without ward, pay seven life. But that is what really pushes it into bomb territory. And that's because for your opponent to kill the sire of seven deaths, they've got to pay seven life. And while that's not nearly as good as, you know, you attacking with the Sire, it does mean no matter what, your opponent has to pay a hefty price. And there are a lot of games where you get to the point where you play the Sire and your opponent's at like six life. And that means they just can't kill him. They can't target him with anything. And other times, sure, they can take it down, but you have other creatures on the board and now they're at four. There will be occasions where your opponent's like way ahead of you. They kill this, go to 13, and then they kill you. That's going to happen but they'd have to be pretty far behind for the ward to be entirely irrelevant to them. And of course, there's a bunch of removal in the format that can't kill the Sire anyway, just because it's so massive. And number three, it's Zamone, Paradox Sculptor. For two generic, a green and a blue, she's a 1-4 legendary human wizard. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, you put a plus one plus one counter on each of up to two target creatures you control. And you can pay a green and a blue and tap her to double the number of each kind of counter on up to two target creatures and or artifacts you control. So Zamone, if you play her on four, is going to just run away with the game immediately. Because it's a combat trigger, that means she's going to come down and put counters on stuff right away. And she can put a counter on herself, so you really only need one other creature to get both counters. She's even better when you can put the counters other places, of course, because that means when your opponent does kill Zamone, you still have all that value left over on the board. And the turn you play her, it also means that she's adding damage to the board that effectively has haste. And then she keeps doing that every combat. So even if your opponent kills Zamone right away, you're going to come away with a bunch of value and feel pretty good about it. And if they don't kill Zamone, they're going to lose because her ability just keeps triggering and things don't even completely in there because her activated ability is actually very relevant. They made it pretty cheap for her to double those counters. And just by the second turn she's in play when you're sending in two creatures with two counters on them, you're already at a point where combat is basically impossible for your opponent because there's no way for them to block effectively. And Zamone will run away with the game whether you get her early or get her late. She's just that powerful. At number two, I've got Quilled Great Worm. For four generic and two green, it's a 7-7 Trampler. And whenever a creature you control deals combat damage during your turn, put that many plus one, plus one counters on it. Importantly, this trigger doesn't care what the combat damage is done to. Sometimes we see effects like this and they're a little too narrow because the creature has to hit your opponent. That's not the case here. If you turn a creature sideways that is big enough to survive combat, it's almost always going to do damage and grow in a big way. And of course, the Grey Worm counts itself, so even if it's all alone, you have a 6-mana 7-7 seven, seven Trampler that will attack your opponent on the next turn and become a 14-14 Trampler. And generally speaking, you're going to have a board when you play Quilled Great Worm, and you're going to have attacks that you can take that are advantageous, since all of your attacks just became a lot better. Your creature, as the reminder text importantly reminds you, does need to survive combat to get those counters, unless it has first strike, but that's okay. You're still talking about a situation where attacking with your creatures gives you a huge advantage, and things don't even in there. The Great Worm, which can easily get counters on your stuff, can come back from the graveyard if you remove six counters from among the creatures you control in addition to paying its other costs. So it's not really a threat that's going to stay dead. This is especially true if you're in like green-white, which has a lot of counters, but Quilled Great Worm is a counter engine all on its own, so it doesn't even need that much help to come back from the graveyard at least once. All right, before we get to the number one card, here are the honorable mentions. These are the cards from my set review that received a bomb grade, but didn't make this list. And at number one, it's Liliana Dreadhorde General. She's a reprint and the only reprint on the list, and she was an insanely strong card in War of the Spark, and there's no reason she won't be here. She's four generic and two black for a six loyalty planeswalker. Whenever a creature you control dies, you draw a card. She has a plus one that makes a two two zombie, a minus four that makes each player sacrifice two creatures, and a minus nine that makes each opponent choose a permanent they control of each permanent type and sacrifice the rest. So Liliana does all of the things that a very, very powerful planeswalker can do. She draws you cards, she can protect herself with a token, and she can remove creatures from the board. And her plus one and minus four get a lot better because of her triggered ability, which will draw you a card whenever a creature dies, because not only does the zombie protect her, it's going to draw you a card, even if it's chump blocking to keep her alive. And that exchange is great. If you trade, it's even better. 
And her minus four can be pretty spicy because while it's symmetrical, you get to draw two cards off of it and your opponent doesn't. So in the end, it's not actually that symmetrical. That's a particularly attractive ability to use when your opponent has exactly two creatures. If that's the case, they have no hope of coming back. Although to be fair, even if you're just using the plus one every single turn, your opponent probably can't come back because you're going to keep drawing cards, outcarding your opponent while ticking up her loyalty and getting to her minus nine isn't particularly far-fetched. And obviously it's game breaking when you use it because your opponent is left with a permanent of each type. So yeah, Liliana is probably the biggest bomb in this format. While all the cards in this list are incredibly difficult to beat, she's probably the hardest. So those are my picks for the 10 biggest bombs in Foundations. If you want to own any of these cards, because most of them are going to be pretty good in 60 card and 100 card formats too, check out the description where you can find a direct Card Kingdom link for each card that appeared in the video. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to check out my set review and other content about every single card in the set, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.